right, so here I solve an elasticity. Can you guys see that? I need a little bigger. All right, so here I solve an elasticity problem, plain elasticity, all right? So there's no reason to use Newton's method. It's a linear problem. I could solve it directly. But I'm also going to show you that it doesn't hurt to solve it <laughs> with Newton's method. You're still going to get to the solution, right? <coughs> All right. And I actually, instead of computing the tangent stiffness exactly, I compute it numerically. <coughs> and so uh, just you'll see that the, the first of it, I, I also I use uh, Gauss integration and a parent element. So the first part of it is r really similar. Basically, th what you see up there are the derivatives of the shape functions with respect to C and eta. With those, I compute uh, B the B matrix, the strain displacement matrix, and J the Jacobian determinant, right? So, uh, and that's a function of X C and eta, and also the deformed position, and I'll, and I'll talk about that in a second, okay? Uh, what I, why I do that, okay? <clears throat> so, I, I solve for, you know, I, f I find the B matrix, strain displacement matrix, and the Jacobian determinant, and then, where, where you'll see the big difference is, instead of just writing down the tangent stiffness matrix, B transpose CB, right, I actually compute the stress. So I have a function that is, computes the stress. And remember, the, the, the B is the strain displacement matrix. So it takes displacements into strains. So B dotted into D gives me strain, okay? Strain times my coefficient matrix gives me stress, okay? And what this is actually a displacement increment. So B times a displacement increment gives me an increment of strain. An increment of strain times my coefficient matrix gives me an increment of stress. And so then I add it to the old stress. So I have, an old, I have a previous stress that I initialized to zero, right? And then I accumulate it, right? So now I can see how the stress evolves over time. It's just going to be linear in this problem, right? But, but I, I wrote this to provide to you guys so that you can take it to the next level and do plasticity, right? So then, uh, so now I, I have the stress. I can compute the force, and the force, the force matrix is just the integral of B times the stress times the Jacobian determinant, right? But because I'm using Gauss integration, I have I use the two by two rule, so I compute that four times, right, at, at the different Gauss points. The square root of one third, one third, minus square root of one third, one third, square root of one third, minus square root of one third, minus minus, right? So then the sum of all those is that integral, right? It's, it's computing the integral B transpose stress J. Um, it, it speeds Mathematica up. Mathematica, if you just do one over three, it's going to treat it like an integer, a, 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 a rational number, and it's going to carry that through. And that's why you, it, when you're doing exact computations, you get really nice fractions at the end and not 0 0.33333, right? Here, I just want to, because I'm going to have decimals, uh, I mean, I, I just want to do double precision computations. So I put the dot there, that tells Mathematica this is a double, convert that immediately into .003333 and just do floating point operations. So it speeds it up a little bit. Right. So that, that's all. In other languages like Python, if you don't put it there, uh, then, then you get a, you can get it, you know, wrong. This is, in Python, if you don't have a dot there, then this is just one, right? <laughs> because it, try, it tries to do the integer divided by an integer. It, it can't do that. It, it's any uh, Fortran would be the same way. Okay, so so now I've computed the force, or this is this is the total force vector. So it's for one element, uh, for a quad, it's it's got two components on each node, right? X and Y force on each node. So it's eight. It's one by eight. Okay. So then I can use that to compute the tangent stiffness. And I do it with a, with a numerical trick, right? I mean, you could use, uh, basically, 
without getting into my code here, uh, because I'm using some complex variable trickery, um, but maybe I don't want to distract you. You could use finite differences here if you want. This is a complex variable finite difference is all I'm doing, which gives me a little bit of a, a, a little bit of an extra advantage. So basically, what I do is I compute the force by perturbing the displacement a, a little bit. So if you're using finite difference, you'd you'd perturb the displacement h and compute the force, and you subtract at minus h, and then you divide by 2h, right? That's going to give you one column of the stiffness matrix, OK? I use a little functional programming to just build it all at once in a one-liner. But basically, what comes out of this is a numerical computation of the tangent stiffness matrix, OK? I actually I, I took it out, but I, I compared it uh, to the analytic uh, for the first step. And to what printed on the screen, they were exactly the same, you know, to the to the four or five decimal places that are actually print to the screen. OK? So all right. So those are the functions I'm going to use to do Newton's method, OK? So in Newton's method, I'm going to have two sort of loops. The outer loop is going to be where I apply my displacement increments. So I'm going to apply a displacement increment and let it equilibrate with a Newton iteration. When it's equilibrated, I'm going to apply another displacement increment and let it equilibrate it, right? Apply another one, let it equilibrate, OK? So, so the outer loop is where I'm doing that. I'm, I'm, here's my problem. It's just a, a, a four node, just one element. This is pinned. This is a roller support. So it can't move in the y, but it can move in the x. And then I pull on that corner in the x direction. So pin, roller, pull that way. So it's minimally constrained. I could, you know, you can't solve it if it's constrained any less than that. Right? I, I minimally constrain it, pull on it. Right? And so what I do is I pull on it in five steps of point 0.1. So point 0.1, point 0.1, point 0.1. Now, it's a linear problem. I could have just went right to point 0.5. It would have solved it. Okay? For nonlinear problems, you can't do that. All right, so then the, the Newton iteration is this second do loop below where I apply the displacement, OK? So the first thing I do is I compute the total force, right? This is the internal force. This is essentially my residual, OK? Now, the residual, what you want to do, you're, you're trying to drive it to 0, OK? You want all the internal forces to be 0. But you're, you're applying loads to it, and those are reaction forces. They're supposed to be there, OK? So everywhere I have a constraint, there's a reaction force in the residual that's supposed to be there. Okay? And so in order to drive the entire thing to 0, I set those. So my degrees of freedom 1, 2 are my pins on the lower left corner. Degree of freedom 4 is the roller support on the lower right corner. And degree of freedom 5 is where I'm pulling on it. Okay? And so I set all of those to 0 in the residual so that when I compute the norm, they don't contribute. Because the reaction forces, they're supposed to be there. I don't want them to contribute to the norm of, of the residual, OK? So I compute the no norm. This is just a scalar value. And, and I print it out, OK? And I say, OK, if this is less than this little number, then break out my loops over, OK? If it's not, compute the tangent stiffness. Modify the tangent stiffness with the boundary conditions. These are basically just shorthand ways to put ones on the diagonal, OK? So I put ones on the diagonal. OK, now I have a tangent stiffness that's been modified correctly, and I solve it. All right, so I solve it. I compute a new displacement increment, go back to the top, start over, go again and again. OK, now, and, and I set a limit here. If it doesn't converge in 10 iterations, then break out. OK, it's a linear problem. And it's, and it's quadratic, it, it, it basically converges in one step. Uh, there's one, you know, you are using a, a numerical approximation, so, so there's a, you know, it takes one step. The initial residual, boom, converged. Converged one step each time, right? Because it's a linear problem. If it's nonlinear, it takes some more, more steps, okay? So I'm taking the five load steps and And then that's the solution. Okay, so 
If you want to modify, I'm going to provide you this code. Now, I don't mean that you have to write it in Mathematica. I'm going to provide it as a reference, okay? Well, th this is going to the, the final. I'm going to sign on Thursday. Come to class Thursday, and, we'll, and I'll, I'll assign it in class, and we'll talk about it, okay? But basically, I'm going to provide you with this code as a reference, and all you have to do, all you have to do is, if you want to use this code, to do plasticity is modify compute stress. If you modify compute stress, putting your return algorithm in, I'm also going to give you an example, at least for perfect plasticity, right, of that. Okay, so you just modify the compute stress and everything else will work because I'm, I'm numerically computing the tangent stiffness and everything. Okay, also this is one element. I'm going to ask you to, to solve a bigger problem, right? So then you have to assemble and all that. Okay, but but other than that, um, the one last little detail I want to point out. Okay, B, the strain displacement relations. Those derivatives are computed with respect to the reference configuration coordinates. Okay. Now, if you remember back when I was at the very beginning, we were talking about theory and we talked about rotation and finite strains, right? Here. This B is, is like a Lagrangian strain measure. So it references back to the reference configuration, OK? Well, if you have, it turns out, then there's this whole thing we didn't even get to talk about in this class called objective strain rates. Because here, I'm basically integrating a constitutive model, right? I have, a, I have a stress and a stress increment, right? So I'm incrementing the stress, and it's accumulating, right? So I'm really solving a stress rate equation, sigma dot equals C right, epsilon dot. And then I just multiply by dt. Then I get delta sigma equals c delta epsilon. So I'm solving a rate equation. And it turns out that the Cauchy rate of stress is not objective to rotations, right? And so, which means that you'll get a, if you, if you take the Cauchy stress and you just rotate it, you get a different stress. It's uh, without doing, stress rate, if you do, without doing anything special, okay? So, you know, without having to go through all the details of finite deformations and all that kind of stuff, because I kind of told you at the beginning of the class, we're just going to assume small strains from here on. What I do to avoid any kind of bad things that can happen is I update my reference configuration at every load step, okay? So I take my initial block and I deform it. I pull on a, you know, point one, and it's deformed, okay? Now, my B matrix at that point is referring back to the reference configuration, right? The undeformed perfect cube, okay? So when I compute the strains, it's with respect to that, okay? Now, everything's equilibrated. I've computed my new displacements, and I increment again. Now my, I've reformulated my B matrix, and that's what that deformed position here. So I, at, every, at every converged it, Newton iterate, I plug in the new locations to update my strain displacement matrix or update my reference configuration, right? So I'm not always referring back to the complete perfect square block, but I'm, I'm, my reference configuration changes at every converged Newton iterate, okay? And that, that keeps me a little bit safe. I mean, the right way to do it is the full-blown finite displacements, uh, you know, where you have, like, your, your finite strain measures, FTF, and all, you know, compute deformation gradients and FTF minus I, one half FTF. So anyway, that's that's sort of why I did that. So it, it's a little little care. So this is so-called updated Lagrangian framework. So at every at every converged iterate, I update my reference configuration, and I go on and on and on. Okay. So again, I'll provide you this code for reference, and uh, and you can either modify it or you know use it as a reference in your own code. Uh, on the, f on the final project, which we'll, we'll talk about Thursday. So I'll sign it Thursday. It'll be due Tuesday, which in the, in the normal final. It's Tuesday, right? Wednesday. Wednesday. Wednesday in the normal final meeting time. I'll probably come for like the first hour for those of you that want to hand in s stuff or whatever. Okay. So um, I got one page here uh, that'll act. So Everything I've talked about so far is just elasticity. I have one page here on Newmark beta for poro elasticity. 
I'll, I'll just, it's just one page, so I'll cover that on Thursday, and then we'll talk about the final. So, all right? And has everyone's turned in homework five as of today? No one has not turned it in. Well, I want to put the solution up. You, you uploaded it. Yeah, okay. So everyone's turned it in either online or by hand. Okay. So I'll, I want to put the solution up today. Okay. And then I'll also add um, a little bit of stuff on the plasticity uh, algorithm, like an actual, some actual code that you can look at for uh, plasticity update algorithm. Right? So your final is basically going to be to solve a, a, a elasticity problem with, with plasticity. You'll have to add in the plasticity upgrade algorithm. I'll take out the plural stuff. We won't do poor. It'll just be elasticity with uh, yeah, my, my thought was poro elasticity or poro plasticity, but I'll take out the poro stuff. We'll just do elasticity with the plastic, the plastic model. Okay? Right. And you just wrote, uh, what's one thing?